Hello. Today I'm going to talk about what I hope is an interesting topic, and it has to do with choosing a fuel for our rocket first stage. And you may have looked uh, at different rockets. Some use uh, one fuel, some use another fuel, some might use a third fuel. And it's not really clear, at least when you first start looking at them, why you might choose one fuel over the other. So I thought this was an interesting topic, and I thought it would be good to talk about. Now, to keep this from being too long, I've ele elected to split it into two separate parts. So there's a first part um, where I kind of take a higher level approach and we'll walk through and we get all the way through that. And uh, when we reach the details point, you may choose to uh, go and spend your time on something more productive for you, or you may stick around and I'll talk a little bit more, a little bit more about the math and a little bit more about some, uh, I get bit up, <laughs> A little bit more about some esoteric topics. So I'll tell you when it's time to make that choice. So when we first start uh, looking at a fuel, uh, looking at a rocket, we need to choose, strangely, perhaps the engine that we need to go first. Um, engine design drives rocket design, uh, not the other way around. So we'll have to choose an engine. Uh, when I need an engine, I like to go to Eddie's Engine Emporium. So uh, I went to Eddie and I said, I'm looking for an engine. And I said, can you give me some different opportunities, uh, different options? And I'd like it to be a high, uh, high performance engine. So uh, give, me some, give me some choices here. And he said, well, I have three choices for you. Um, the first one is an engine called the RD-180. Um, it's made by a company known as NPO Energomash. Um, this is a Russian company. And it's what we call a Keralox engine. And uh, Keralox means kerosene, liquid oxygen. Um, so put those together, you get Keralox. Um, in the US, we'd actually use, instead of kerosene, we'd use a fuel called RP1, which is a refined kerosene. Um, and Unfortunately, in the U.S., we'll kind of pretend those two are the same thing. Um, we'll say Keralox, but we'll mean RP1 locks, and that's just what we call it. Uh, second engine Eddie came up with is SpaceX's Raptor. This is a methalox engine, so it uses liquid methane, liquid oxygen. And then finally, the third engine he came up with is the RS-25. This was the engine, uh, the main engine for the space shuttle. It's made by Aerojet Rocketdyne, and it is a hydrolox engine, or liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. Now, when you're choosing a car, one of the things you care about is fuel economy, and we actually care about that when we choose rocket engines as well. And the way we measure that is through a measure called a Specific Impulse. Um, it's abbreviated ISP. And Rocket engines have different ISPs depending on whether they're at sea level, right when we take off, or whether they're up in vacuum, uh, kind of when they're finished doing their work. So um, that's why I have two columns here, and we'll see that different kinds of engines have different ISPs. Um, the RD-180 goes from 310 to 337. Uh, the Raptor goes from 330 to 348. And the RS-25 goes from 366. Uh, all the way up to 452. Now ISP depends both on the design of the engine. There are some engines that give you better ISPs uh, than other, uh, but, uh, and it also depends upon the actual physics or chemistry of the fuel and the oxidizer you're using. So uh, Hydrolox uh, engines just inherently have better ISPs than Keralox engines, uh, just the way things work. So uh, now we have three engines that we're kind of going to uh, kind of compare. And I guess we're going to do a, a design, kind of a design test or uh, design concepts here to see which one we want to choose. Um, so we have some engines. Um, there's something else we need to know about uh, what we're doing, and that's about propellant densities. Um, and Propellants, uh, propellant is just the generic term. We have liquid oxygen is an oxidizer, so it supplies oxygen. 
Um, the others I have listed here, kerosene, liquid methane, liquid hydrogen, are fuels. Um, generically, they're called propellants. And what we see if we look at this chart is liquid oxygen is actually quite dense. Um, it's a little over 1,200 kilograms per cubic meter. Um, kerosene is about 800, liquid methane is a little over 400, and then liquid hydrogen is only about 70. So liquid hydrogen is the least dense uh, propellant. Now, to make this a uh, little easier to deal with when we start having to do some calculations, um, I've come up with something I call the tank size ratio. So if you had a tank um, that held a given amount of liquid oxygen, um, how much would you hold of the other amount? How big of a tank would you need to hold one of the other fuels? So we have a tank that holds one unit of LOX to hold one point to hold the same amount of RP1 uh, requires a tank that's 1.4 times the volume. Uh, for liquid methane, it's 2.7 times the volume. And for uh, liquid hydrogen, it's 16 times the volume. So this isn't really very surprising looking at the chart. Uh, liquid hydrogen is not very dense. So obviously to, to hold a given amount, you're going to need a much bigger tank than you would for the other propellants. So uh, how would we take that information and figure out what tank size we'd want? And I'm going to do as an example uh, the liquid oxygen, uh, liquid methane Raptor engine. So we're going to build a rocket for that. We know that we need uh, to have a tank for liquid oxygen. We know we need to have a tank for liquid methane. So how do we figure out what size tanks we need? Well, the first thing we know is we had the mixture ratio that, that the engine manufacturer told us. And the engine, ma the engine manufacturer said that when we are uh, running this engine, we need 3.55 parts of liquid oxygen to one part of liquid methane. And that's a, a measure by weight or by mass, I guess is the way I'd say it. So what does that mean? Well, we need a lot of liquid oxygen. We only need a little liquid methane. So we end up with a large liquid oxygen tank and kind of a, a fairly tiny uh, liquid oxygen. Well, it's not really tank size. This is the amount of mass we need. So we need a large mass of liquid oxygen and a large mass and a smaller mass of liquid methane. Um, but remember, we need to factor in the density. And that's why I came up with that density ratio. Uh, we remember that liquid oxygen is much denser than liquid methane. So uh, we factor that in. Uh, one part of LOX uh, is uh, equivalent to 2.7 parts of liquid methane. So what does that mean? Well, it means that small amount of liquid methane actually takes quite a bit more tank space than uh, the amount of LOX we had. So finally, after we've done these two calculations, we can figure out the relative tank size between these two propellants. And it turns out that uh, we have a tank. Uh, if we say we have a tank that's holding a uh, given amount of LOX, given volume, we need about three quarters of that volume in liquid methane. So just a little, uh, a little smaller, not a ton smaller. So now that you understand how we figure out tank size, we can apply this to the three different vehicles or the three different first stages that we're trying to build. So here's what the Carolox one looks like. So um, we have a LOX tank, and I just kind of chose a specific size that would look good on the slide. And we have a RP1 tank on top. And it turns out because RP1 is a pretty dense fuel, and because of the mixture ratio, we need a tank that's about 55% uh, the size of a LOX tank, LOX tank, at least in volume. So what that means is if we build an RP-1 rocket, it's pretty compact. We need space for LOX. Um, we don't need a lot of space for fuel. So uh, this is what the methalox version looks like. So that's the example we did in the last slide. And as I said, the liquid methane tank is about 75% the size of the LOX tank. 
So you can say all the tankage on the Carolox rocket is about 1.5 times, 1.55 times the LOX. Um, all the tankage in the Mexilox, Methalox rocket is about 1.75 times. So the, these are both pretty compact rockets. So what's the Carolox rocket like? The Hydrolox rocket like? Um, well, guess what? Um, it turns out that even though the mixture ratio is pretty high, you remember it was about six. So that means we need six parts of liquid oxygen to one part of liquid hydrogen. Um, it turns out because the density of liquid hydrogen is so low, we need a big tank for the liquid hydrogen. And in fact, the tank size is about two and a half size, about two and a half times the LOX tank. So what does this give us? This gives us a rocket that's somewhere in the range of twice as big in terms of volume compared to the Carolox or the Methalox ones. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about propellant temperatures here. So RP1 would typically be room temperature or outside temperature, just whatever temp it's in the tank. So something around 21 centigrade. Uh, LOX is normally about 193 minus uh, minus 193, 83 degrees centigrade. Um, if we look at methylox, um, lox is of course the same temperature. Liquid methane is about 20 degrees warmer than liquid oxygen, so minus 162. Now the important part of both of these is that these propellants are actually close enough in temperature that we can get away with what's called a common bulkhead. And what that means is, in this sort of configuration, the top of the LOX tank is the bottom of the fuel tank above it. So we don't have to build you know, two separate, separate tanks. We just kind of build a bottom tank, and then we kind of use uh, part of the bottom tank as part of the top tank. Now, in reality, if we were doing this for real, they aren't actually flat rectangles like this. The tanks actually have domed ends. Uh, to deal with the pressure. But the same concept still applies. Um, we can use a common bulkhead. If we go over and look at hydrolox, we'll see that the temperature of liquid hydrogen is extremely cold. It's minus 253 degrees Celsius. And because of that temperature difference, we actually cannot use a common bulkhead. So you notice I've drawn kind of a little space in between here and that space has some sort of insulation. And what we typically have is instead of a flat space, we'd have two domes kind of next to each other with some space in between. Um, there might be foam insulation, there might actually be just empty space. It kind of depends upon the design. In addition, because the liquid hydrogen is so cold, we need insulation on the outside of the tank now here I've shown it all the way over the tank. Um, we might insulate it that way. We might go thinner with the insulation over the box, uh, or we just might uh, go the same, the same way all the way across. So one of the things that happens in the hydrolox design, you notice our tanks are bigger, so our tanks are heavier, and we have to have this extra gap, which makes our tanks taller, and we have to have insulation. And all of those affect the weight and I just dug up a little picture here with tank insulation. Uh, this is a space shuttle external tank uh, showing kind of a cut of way, what it, look, what it looks like before you spray on insulation and what it looks like after you spray on insulation. And obviously the insulation, uh, you have to uh, fabricate that, you have to put it on and you have to pay for it. So that's, an, I guess, another downside of Hydrolox. So, the obvious question becomes, uh, what is the performance of these relative uh, to each other? Um, which one is a better, a better rocket fuel choice? And we use delta V, uh, a measure called delta V is a way of comparing the capability of different launchers. Um, I'm not gonna go into it here. I will link uh, in the description to another talk I did that talks uh, a lot about delta V, but it's generally the way we compare launchers. Um, I'm making a lot of assumptions about the materials we're using, the thicknesses, how much things weigh, how much uh, the rocket engines weigh, and a bunch of other factors. Um, 
That means it's not realistic in the sense of you wouldn't run a company based on these numbers, but it's good enough for our comparison. So what do we get? Um, we get about 4,200 meters per second out of Kerovox. We get about 4,250 meters per second out of Methylox. Now I could change those the assumptions around and probably get those to flip pretty easily. Hydrolox, we get 4,450 meters per second. And I think I can come up with a scenario where Hydrolox probably loses, but in general, we might expect to get just a little bit better performance out of Hydrolox than we would out of these other fuels. So that would kind of indicate that we should look at Hydrolox, but there are a few issues. And uh, the first thing I thought I would show you is what Falcon 9 would look like as a Hydrolox rocket. So Falcon 9 is a Carolox rocket. And one of the goals that SpaceX had when they designed Falcon 9 was that the diameter of the rocket be small enough that they could put it on a truck and ship it across the US. Um, Falcon 9 is built in California. They do testing, uh, test firing of the stages in Texas, and then most of their launches happen in Florida. So shipping is actually problematic if they can't ship by truck. And that's one of the reasons why Falcon 9 is this tall, thin rocket, uh, not, not really terribly wide around. Now, as we noticed on the last slide, if we had Hydrolox, we ended up with much more volume in the tank. And if you need bigger tanks, but you need to keep the same diameter, this is what you end up with. Which, okay, it's, it's obviously a very silly thing to do uh, because you can't physically build a rocket like this. It's just too long and too thin. It's going to break in the middle. But that does illustrate a point of why uh, SpaceX chose to do Carolox for the Falcon 9. It just made their design much, much more compact, much easier uh, in a lot of senses than it would be if they did uh, Hydrolox. If they did Hydrolox, they would have to have a rocket that's bigger around, um, and that would be uh, less efficient from their perspective. There's this other problem with liquid hydrogen called hydrogen embrittlement. And basically, if we look at the structure of metals, uh, metals in general uh, are crystals. Um, I'm oversimplifying a lot. But uh, what happens is you can have metals in contact with hydrogen, and those hydrogen molecules are really, really tiny. And they can actually kind of seep or ooze into uh, the gaps between the crystals. And they end up uh, pulling the crystals apart. And that's called hydrogen, hydrogen embrittlement, and that makes your nice metal alloys brittle. And how bad it is depends upon what kind of material you, you're using, what kind of pressure on the hydrogen, and a whole bunch of different factors. But uh, this is a concern, and it makes hydrogen hard to deal with. Um, here's a picture. This is a microscope shot of what a metal alloy that's hydrogen embrittled actually looks like, and you can notice, hey, there are a lot of cracks there. Um, and those are cracks you do not want in your metal alloy. And here's a picture I found of a uh, threaded stud. I think this is steel um, after it's hydrogen embrittled, and you can see the top just broke, flat out broke off because it lost strength. So uh, both of those issues, the, the size of the tankage and dealing with hydrogen embrittlement and dealing with those very low temperatures makes uh, hydrogen kind of a pain in the ass fuel to deal with. So you probably noticed that uh, different engines or different vehicles use different choices. So let's look at some rockets and talk about their choices. So I'm gonna start with the Saturn V. Um, it could launch about 130 tons into low Earth orbit. Um, I've classified it as Carolox because it used a Carolox first stage. Um, the second and third stages are actually Hydrolox. And just looking at that rocket and knowing what we do about tank sizes, you can see that if this was a Hydrolox first stage, 
um, that first stage would have to be much, much more massive. Think of something that's, you know, two and a half times the volume of that stage. Um, it's already a very, very big rocket. Um, I've been talking about SpaceX. We have a Falcon Heavy. It does about 63 tons to low Earth orbit, or that's at least its uh, theoretical maximum. Um, you can see it's a pretty compact rocket, and it's Carolox both first stage and second stage. Um, the Atlas V, made by ULA, um, it has Carolox first stage. In fact, it actually uses the RD-180 engine that I was talking about. Uh, it has about 20 tons to low Earth orbit, although uh, Atlas uh, uses uh, a number of solid rocket boosters on uh, kind of to improve its payload performance. So with light payloads, it might launch without any. Uh, with uh, payloads go, going up, it will add more solid rockets. And then finally, we have the Russian Soyuz. Uh, Kirillok's first stage, about seven tons to low Earth orbit. Okay, so those are the Kirillok's ones, and you notice uh, they all kind of have a similar appearance and kind of similar largeness, I guess I would call it. Let's go over and look at Hydrolox. And starting at the high end, we have uh, Space Launch System Block 1, which is should be good for about 95 tons to low Earth orbit. And we will see that it has a Hydrolox core stage, and then on the outside it has two large solid rocket boosters. Moving over to Ariane 5, which is a, a nice commercial launcher. Once again, it has a Hydrolox center, uh, center core they would call it, and two solid rocket boosters. Going next to the space shuttle, uh, it is a uh, Hydrolox center, and then two large solid rocket boosters. And you probably noticed a pattern here that uh, we have uh, center cores that are running Hydrolox, and then we have solid rocket boosters on the outside. And uh, that's pretty common with Hydrolox simply because of the tank size. If you wanted to do SLS uh, purely with Hydrolox, um, you would need just giant, giant tanks. Um, you notice as it is, it's not much bigger than Saturn V, at least in diameter. Uh, take away the solid rockets and it's two and a half times bigger in volume. Oh, and I wanted to talk about uh, payloads. So SLS Block 1, about 95 tons. Uh, Ariane 5, about 20 tons. Uh, space Shuttle, if you put a payload in the payload bay, it could be up to 27 tons, but you're taking the orbiter up to orbit and back. So that means the capacity is somewhat higher. Um, I don't know what the right number is. Um, it depends on how you decide to count weight. Uh, so I just threw in 90 tons. Uh, Delta IV Heavy, this is kind of an outlier when it comes to Hydrolox rockets in that it does not use solid rocket boosters. Um, what it uses, uh, what's called a common core, and you have three common cores next to each other. Um, and it kind of uses the same approach Falcon Heavy does. So we'll burn the outer cores until they're done, and then we'll burn the center one a little longer. I really like Delta IV for the illustration here, because in this rendering, um, they are actually showing us the different tanks. So the bottom orange part is the liquid hydrogen tank. And you can tell that it's uh, very big uh, because liquid hydrogen tanks have to be very big. Um, the top tank is the liquid oxygen tank. So you can see like when we did our model, it's about two and a half times. Uh, uh, the liquid hydrogen tank is about two and a half times the size of the liquid oxygen tank. And then the white part is the uh, what we call the, the inner tank or and that's the space in between the liquid oxygen tank and the liquid hydrogen tank. So you can see, you know, for a given amount uh, of, of uh, propellant, um, the Delta IV Heavy is actually pretty big. And you can see it does 29 tons to low Earth orbit, which is actually a, a pretty, pretty uh, nice, but it's quite a bit less than Falcon Heavy. And that's just partly because of the size of the tanks. Um, it needs big tanks to be hydrolox.
So those are kind of the major Carolox and Hydrolox ones. Um, Methylox, we don't actually have any rockets that are flying yet, um, or at least flying kind of in their final form. Um, there's a ULA Vulcan, and it has a Carolox, I mean Methylox first stage. Um, it will also, like Atlas V, use solid rocket boosters if it needs them for more, uh, for more payload. And then finally, we have the SpaceX uh, Starship, which is Methylox in the first stage and Methylox in the second stage. So that's uh, just a little view of the kinds of rockets we have that use different fuels. And I think the important part is just to understand why the Hydrolox rockets, uh, pretty, much, pretty much most of them, uh, use solid rocket boosters. So um, in summary, so when you just look at the ISPs, um, Hydrolox looks like a great fuel. You know, the ISP of, of Hydrolox engines is so much higher than the others, but um, it requires big tanks, um, which are just bad from a, a general perspective, and they weigh a lot more. And it also requires dealing with the downsides of hydrogen um, and the dealing with cold temperatures and dealing with the embrittlement. Um, and I would say in general, uh, Carolox is a simpler alternative. That's why there are a lot of uh, successful rockets out there that use Carolox first stages. Uh, Methylox looks like it's a reasonable choice uh, compared to Carolox. Um, it hasn't really been used successfully yet, but it, it looks like it will be in the next year or so. Um, Methylox has some significant advantages if you're trying to do reusable engines, and that's why um, it's showing up. Uh, in new designs now when reusability becomes interesting. So that kind of takes me to the end of the uh, simplified or the more interesting part of the discussion. Um, if you want to go and spend your time elsewhere, this would be a good, good time to stop. Um, if you want to go on to the details, here we go. And I'd like to start by talking about the tank size calculations and uh, kind of show you how I did this. Um, I set up a spreadsheet to do all the calculations. So I started by assuming we have a LOX tank. We're going to say our rocket is three meters in diameter. The LOX tank is six meters high. Um, this is really an arbitrary choice um, just because I needed to choose some size. So that tank holds about uh, 42 cubic meters. Uh, its volume is about 42 cubic meters. We know from the LOX density, that's about 48,000 kilograms of LOX. Um, we know the RD180 mixture ratio, so we can divide the, the uh, LOX mass by the mixture ratio, and that will tell us the RP1 mass. It's a little uh, 18,600 kilograms. And then finally, we know the density of RP1. We can go and look that up and figure out we need 23 uh, cubic meters of RP1. And then finally, I know uh, basically how to calculate that back to tank height. And that gives us a tank that's uh, 3.25 meters high. So that's where the 55% comes. And the spreadsheet does this for, for all the different ones that I can play around with, uh, with other things as well. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about mixture ratios because this is a little bit uh, confusing or surprising. So if you've taken chemistry and you've looked at combustion, um, you've probably heard of something called the stoichiometric ratio. And this is basically the ratio at which both of the, the fuel and the oxidizer are used up fully. You know, and it turns out for oxygen and hydrogen, you'd need eight parts of oxygen by weight and one part of hydrogen by weight. And you put them all together and they all burn and they burn very well. And that gives you uh, nothing left over and it gives you the most heat. Uh, ah, unfortunately, uh, stoichiometric combustion um, is too hot when you're dealing with rocket engines. And uh, because of that, we run rocket engines at a different ratio. If you run them at stoichiometric ratio, they melt. And I just pulled up a little chart here. Um, this is about uh, actually burning, uh, burning fuels in air, but the principle still applies. 
So equivalence ratio of one would mean stoichiometric combustion. So you can see if we're at that, that's where our peak temperature is. And as soon as we start moving away to a different, uh, different equivalence ratio, different mixture ratio in rocket terms, um, we cool things down quite a bit. And if we look at the difference between uh, eight to one for liquid hydrogen and six to one for liquid hydrogen, it's roughly uh, a ratio of one, uh, either 1.25 or 0 0.75. I don't remember which way the chart goes. But you can see that that's a drop of 300 to 500 degrees Kelvin. Um, and that is a big difference when it comes to trying to design a rocket engine um, that can survive high temperature. So uh, running at a uh, non-stoichiometric mixture ratio uh, is, is very important from, for the longevity of your rocket components. And finally, I thought since we're talking about propellants, I wanted to talk a little bit about subchilled propellants. And when we talked about densities, I kind of skipped over one thing. When we talk about density of liquid oxygen or liquid hydrogen or liquid methane or even RP1, um, all those densities are at a specific temperature. I gave you the temperatures um, and then you can say, you know, you can put this amount of mass in a given volume. But if you cool these propellants to a lower temperature, um, they shrink a little, the molecules get closer together, and you can jam more of that propellant into a given volume. So what does this mean? Well, it means if we chill our liquid oxygen colder than the numbers that I gave you, um, it shrinks, and then we can therefore fit more into a given tank size. And that gives us an advantage. It means we can use smaller tanks and therefore the structure of our rocket is lighter. Um, a few numbers. So if you cool liquid oxygen from 183, minus 183 down to minus 207, it gets about 10% denser. Um, that's actually quite a bit. Um, RP1, uh, you can't cool RP1 too much because it's a liquid and it'll start to gel and freeze and crystallize and that doesn't work well with rockets but you can go down to about minus seven centigrade and that'll make it about two percent denser uh, liquid methane you can cool uh, about nine degrees or i guess that's 11 degrees and that'll get you four percent denser um, you can't go much colder than that because you're getting close to the temperature where it will turn to a solid and uh Solids don't work well. Uh, liquid hydrogen, you can cool uh, just six degrees from minus 253 down to minus 259, um, and that would give it give you something 7% denser. But of course, you're already having issues with how cold liquid hydrogen is now, and going another six degrees just makes all of your issues harder. Um, I did some calculations uh, on what this would mean from a delta V perspective, and I think just, just doing the locks alone uh, gave me about 5% more delta V. So it's a surprisingly significant difference if you can go to sub-chilled propellants. Um, SpaceX uses sub-chilled uh, locks at RP-1 on Falcon 9. It's sometimes called densified instead of sub-chilled. Uh, those two things mean the same thing. SpaceX is planning to use sub-chilled locks and liquid methane on Starship. Um, Starship is only in test right now, and I doubt they're using subchilled yet, but uh, I fully expect they will. Um, no other launchers that I know of use subchilled propellants. Uh, NASA has done some research I've seen on the liquid hydrogen subchilling, but I haven't seen uh, any sign that anyone is actually using this anywhere other than SpaceX. So uh, that's all the, the information I wanted to cover. And Eddie, thanks you for your business.